Let's pay homage to the Blessed One, the fully enlightened Supreme Buddha. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. I pay homage to my teacher, Luke Solomon. Sadhu, Sadhu. Uh, if you can remember the sutta we were discussing about, the Chula Tanna Sankhya Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle End Discourses of the Buddha. And uh, do you remember uh, the Lord of Gods, the, the Sakha Deva, went to the Buddha? They asked about the, the Nibbana, a very deep question about the end of craving, end of suffering. And then Buddha gave a very um, uh, profound teaching about the, the freedom from suffering. Do you remember that beginning part of the sutta? We discussed, uh, even though that instruction was in brief, we discussed it all the um, deep meanings, answer given by the Buddha about Nibbana. Yeah, the question, uh, the good Sakast Bhante, how do you briefly define a mendicant who is freed through the ending of craving, who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate goal, and is best among gods and humans. And then the Buddha answered, um, Lord of gods, it is when a mendicant has heard nothing is worth insisting on. When a mendicant has heard that nothing is worth insisting on, they directly, he directly knows all things, directly knowing all things. He completely understands all things. Having completely understood all things, when he experiences any kind of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, he meditates, observing impermanence, dispassion, cessation, and letting go in those feelings. Meditating in this way, he doesn't grasp at anything in the world, not grasping. Uh, he's not anxious, not being anxious. He personally becomes extinguished. He understands rebirth is ended. The spiritually, spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence, right? So there is no return to any state of existence means he has escaped from the cycle of birth and death. Uh, so that means he has achieved Nibbana and he has achieved this the cessation of dependent origination. There are no more causes and effect. Uh, there is no cause and effect mechanism. Uh, there is no functioning of that mechanism anymore in his life. So that is the end of suffering. That is how I briefly define a mendicant who is free through the ending of craving, who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate goal and the best among gods and him. And we discussed why uh, this uh, liberated one is known as the best among gods and human, right? Because he has put an end to the suffering. That is the only reason why somebody becomes the best among gods and humans, right? Even though an individual is so famous, very, will, very rich and wealthy, powerful still if that person is enveloped in suffering and not freed from suffering and uh, still journeying in this um, uh, cycle of birth and death how can he become a best person because he's still emerged in suffering uh, he's subject to aging subject to sickness subject to death subject to sorrow pain lamentation physical suffering, mental suffering in, in countless lives, right? So the to be the best among gods and humans, one should one should attain enlightenment and, and escape from this cycle of birth and death, which has been achieved by this fortunate 
individual, the uh, the liberated monk or the nun, or the liberated disciple of the Buddha. And we discussed about uh, in very details about these uh, um, different kinds of feelings and how the dependent origination is arranged based on the underlying tendencies towards this, each feeling. And um, we discussed about the cessation of uh, dependent origination in terms of the, the abandonment of uh, underlying tendencies towards each feeling. We discussed uh, those things using Samadhi Bhavana Sutta and also some other suttas. So after this advice was given by the Buddha to go Sakka, what happened? So he was listening to this with uh, much respect and faith. Then what happened? We are going to learn today. Then Sakka, Lord of Gods, Having, a, having approved and agreed with what the Buddha said, bowed and respectfully circled the Buddha, keeping him on his right before vanishing right there. Now at that time, Venerable Mahamungalana was sitting not far from the Buddha. He thought, did that spirit comprehend what the Buddha said when he agreed with him or not? Why don't I find out? And then Venerable Mahamungalana as easily as a strong person would extend or contract their arm, vanished from the Eastern Monastery and reappeared among the gods of the 33. Now at that time, Saka was amusing himself in the single lotus park, supplied and provided with a divine orchestra. Um, so dear Dhamma friends, now you can see Arahantero Mahamogallana also listen to that advice, right? When the Buddha was giving the advice to Godshaka, and what did he think? He wanted to know, he saw the Godshaka approving the Buddha's answer, accepting it, and uh, after paying homage to the Buddha, the Godshaka left. So, Muhammad Thero had compassion, and he wanted to know whether the God Shaka comprehended the teaching fully, what happened after he listened to the teachings from the Buddha. So he just wanted to check. So Mahamukkalana Bhante was the chief, the foremost among the monks who had psychic powers. So Mahamukkalana Bhante using psychic powers disappeared from the human world uh, and reappeared among the Thawatinsa gods, the uh, Thawatinsa heaven. And uh, you can learn uh, more things about heaven and um, some of the activities and feelings of gods and all these things when you uh, read through this sutta. So the god Shaka at that time, he was enjoying in the Nandana park at uh, the Tawat in heaven, you know, like in the human world, right? He was uh, enjoying the divine pleasures because the heavenly world is also in the realm of, uh, in the sensory realm, it's included in the sensory realm. So gods amuse themselves with uh, divine beauty, divine uh, sound, divine smell, divine taste, divine tangible, and so on. So he was listening to music when uh, Mughalana Bhante visited the God Shaka. Seeing Maha Mughalana coming off in the distance, he dismissed the orchestra, approached Maha Mughalana, and said, Come, my good Mughalana. Welcome, good sir. It's been a long time since you took the opportunity to come here. Sit, my good Mogalana. This seat is for you. Maha Mogalana sat down on the seat spread out, and while Saka took a low seat and sat to one side. Uh, Maha Mogalana said to him, Kosia, 
How did the Buddha briefly explain freedom through the ending of craving? Please share this talk with me so that I can also get to hear it. My good Mogalana, I have many duties and much to do, not only for myself, but also for the gods of the 33. Besides, I quickly forget even things I've properly heard, learned, attended, and memorized. Once upon a time, a battle was fought between the gods and the demons. In that battle, the gods won and the demons lost. When I returned from that battle as a conqueror, I created the Palace of Victory. The Palace of Victory has a hundred towers. Each tower has 700 chambers. Each chamber has seven nymphs. Each nymph has seven maids. Would you like to see the lovely Palace of Victory? Maha Mogalana consented in silence. Now you can see the, the similarities between uh, humans and gods, right? Uh, same uh, behavior kind of thing. So when he was questioned by Arman Mogalana Thero about the teaching uh, that he learned from the Buddha, he completely changed the topic, right? Uh, saying that he's so busy and uh, he's engaged in so many duties and uh, so he, he basically forgot what he learned. That's what he said. And then uh, he was, the God Sarka was questioned in the midst of or the, the, the assembly of all the devas. So he was he was kind of ashamed to assume that Mahamugalana Bhante would know that he was weak and he couldn't he couldn't grasp the teaching, he couldn't memorize it well. So he just wanted to change the topic and start an, a different conversation with the Arhantero. That's why he brought up this um, topic about the battle and how he um, won the battle and then he with his psychic powers he created the Vaijanti Prasad the palace of victory and he was explaining about how mighty and magnificent it is um, do people also do like this? Hmm? do they explain about their house new house to their friends? Hmm? about their vehicles yeah, people about do. their properties, you know, when friends come, let's go to see my new brand new vehicle, brand new house, brand new property, right? So the same thing is happening. And Mughalanavanti consented in silence, right? He's, he has this compassion for this uh, Dhamma friend. He was a Dhamma friend, Kalyan. And my, the Gorsaka respected Mughalanavanti. Before uh, continue, may I ask, uh, that is the word that uh, Mahamo, Bante Mahamogalana say Kosia. What is hmm. what does it mean, Kosia? Is that the nickname for Godsaka? Correct. That was kind of friendly addressing to Godsaka. And also, uh, Supreme Buddha also would use the same, same word. Uh, there are different names. For the god Shaka, Koshia, uh, Devana, I mean the. Then putting Venerable Mahamogalana in front, Saka, Lord of Gods, and Vesavana, the great king, went to the Palace of Victory. When they saw Mogalana coming off in the distance, Saka's maids, being prudent and discreet, each went to her own bedroom. They were just like a daughter-in-law who is prudent and discreet when they see their father-in-law. Then Saka and Vesavana encouraged Mogalana to wander and explore the palace, saying, See in this palace, my good Mogalana, this lovely thing and that lovely thing that looks nice for Venerable Kosia, just like for someone who has made merit in the past. Humans, when they see something lovely, also say it looks nice enough for gods and of the 33. Gods for the 30. Gods. It looks nice enough for gods of the 33. 
That looks nice for Venerable Kosia, just like for someone who has made merit in the past. Then Mokalana thought, this spirit lives much too negligently. Why don't I stir up the sense of urgency in him? Then Mokalana used his psychic powers to make the Palace of Victory shake and rock and tremble with his big toe. Then Saka, Vesavana, and the gods of 33, their mindful of wonder and amazement, thought, it's incredible. It's amazing. The ascetic has such power and might that he makes the gods' home shake and rock and tremble with his big toe. When the god Sakha was there with Arant Mughalana Tero and uh, who was Sakha's friend, god Vesavana, one of the four great kings of gods, and King Vesavana, uh, god Vesavana also was there. And both of them were um, gladly explaining details of the building, beauty of the building to Arahant Mughalana Tero. And they completely forgot that they were um, walking with uh, somebody who is detached from the world and who is uh, who has abandoned uh, the craving and desire for all the material things, worldly pleasures. They they forgot, and um, they forgot that they were uh, they were work, walking with an enlightened uh, monk, a liberated monk. So, and also. Um, at that time, around Mughal they thought, you know, these these gods, uh, they 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 think about these divine pleasures too much, and they are infatuated and intoxicated by these things, and they are negligent because of that. So, around Mughal they had compassion. He wanted to help them to come to senses and understand that everything is impermanent subject to change, everything has a temporary lifetime, you know, things will decay and pass away. The Dhamma is the only, only refuge, uh, even for gods. So Arhan Mughalana Bhante wanted to help him. Uh, so what did he do? He played a miracle, right? Using his psychic powers. What did he do? He shook the, um, and trembled the, the, Palace of Victory, the huge mansion, divine mansion with his big toe that the gods realized. And also, did you, did you see that uh, the gods, uh, the god suckers made the nymphs or the, the, uh, the female devas? Uh, they were dancing and singing uh, before the Arahant Mughalamante uh, arrived. And when they saw Arhant Mughalana Bhante, they all went to their chambers. They were ashamed because they knew that, like even uh, at the sight of, uh, of a holy person uh, who, practice, who practices uh, celibacy, or lifetime celibacy, um, they could recognize that somebody, a very holy person has arrived and so they just uh, they hid in their in their rooms. Bante, mm -hmm. when Ma Mungalana used the psychic power to to shake and rock and tremble the palace with this mm. big toe, uh, so it looks like it's kind of kind of an earthquake, right? <laughs> Incredible, they said. Yeah, it's the trembling. It's an earthquake. So they, but no, no, nobody was harmed. Okay. That's fine. because okay. of the, the psychic powers are used by an arahant, right? So it's nobody's harm. Just out of compassion. Okay. Then they were so amazed. They were surprised seeing the power and might of, of a human being, right? Still, Arahant Sariputta, Arahant Mughalana Bhante was a human being, and that power of a human being surpassed the power and might of all the gods. So they were amazed about it. Okay, now 
Mughalabante realized now they are uh, shock and they are intoxication, infatuation with uh, divine pleasures have disappeared now, and now is the right time for him to ask the question again. So that's what he is going to do. Knowing that Sakka was shocked and awestruck, Moggallana said to him, Kosia, how did the Buddha briefly explain freedom through the ending of craving? Please share this talk with me so that I can also get to hear it. My dear Moggallana, I approached the Buddha, bowed, stood to one side and said to him, Sir, how do you briefly define a medicant who is freed with the ending of craving, who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate goal, and is best among gods and humans? When I had spoken, the Buddha said to me, Lord of gods, it's when a medicant has heard nothing is worth insisting on. When a mendicant has heard that nothing is worth insisting on, they directly know all things. Directly knowing all things, they completely understand all things. Having completely understood all things, when they experience any kind of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, they meditate observing impermanence, this passion, cessation, and let it go in those feelings. Meditating in this way, they don't grasp at anything in the world. Not grasping, they are not anxious. Not being anxious, they personally become extinguished. They understand rebirth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done. There is no return to any state of existence. That's how I briefly define a medican who is free through the ending of craving, who has reached the ultimate end, the ultimate sanctuary, the ultimate spiritual life, the ultimate goal, and is best among gods and humans. That's how the Buddha briefly explained freedom through the end of craving to me. Moggallana approved and agreed with what Saka said as easily as a strong person would extend or contract their arm, he vanished from among the gods of the 33 and reappeared in the Eastern monastery. Soon after Mokkalana left, Saka's mates said to him, good sir, was that the blessed one, your teacher? No, it was not. That was my spiritual companion, Venerable Maha Mokkalana. You're fortunate, good sir, so very fortunate to have a spiritual companion of such power and might. We can't believe that's not the blessed one, your teacher. Then Maha Mokgalana went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, do you recall briefly explaining freedom through the end of craving to a certain well-known and illustrious spirit? I do, Moggallana, and the Buddha retold all that happened when Sakka came to visit him. Adding, that's how I recall briefly explaining freedom through the end of craving to Sakka, Lord of Gods. That is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, Venerable Maha Moggallana was happy with what the Buddha said. Sad, sad, sad. That is how... Uh... Rahad Mughal Alabante visited heaven and asked, uh, discussed the Dhamma with God Sakha. And uh, the other devas, uh, the female devas, the attendant devas, the God Sakha, they didn't, they, they, they hadn't seen the Buddha or the uh, Rahad Mughal Alabante before, right? So they thought, oh, so how did they know that about? So uh, when they asked about um, the Blessed One from the uh, God Shaka, how did they know that? Because God Shaka was uh, always praising the Blessed One, the Buddha, and the and the disciples of the Buddha in heaven. They have uh, Dhamma programs in heaven. We have discussed about those before. They have uh, 
big Dhamma hall in heaven called Sudharma Dhamma hall. And there the Buddha would, the, the, the Lord Shaka would uh, teach the Dhamma to the other gods. And God Shaka was somebody um, who has lots of faith and confidence in the enlightenment of the Buddha. And he was, he was a stream entrant. He, he already attained the first stage of enlightenment. He was not an ordinary, ordinary heavenly being. So that's how other uh, gods already knew about the Buddha, the power of the Buddha, the might of the Buddha, the amazing wisdom of the Buddha, but they hadn't seen before. That's why they, they, they thought, oh, maybe this, this is the, the blessed one. Uh, whose qualities are always praised by the uh, by our leader, but uh, God Shaka said, "No, no, that was not my teacher. That was not my blessed one. That was one of his disciples. He one of his followers." Right? So then they thought, other devas thought, "Oh, if a disciple is that powerful and that mighty, we can't even imagine the power, um, the mighty of uh, of." your teacher, the Blessed One. So they also develop that faith and confidence in the Blessed One and Blessed One's abilities. So, but, and the interesting thing is that when that intoxication and pride about um, he, the God Saka's achievements and divine pleasures, when that intoxication disappeared after the, the, the miracle displayed by Arhan Mugga Lord Shaka remembered the answer. So it was in the back of his mind, but it was it was blocked by all these uh, distractions, desires, you know, sense desires and all these things. Doesn't the same thing happen to us? Hmm? The wisdom is blocked by these desires. Same thing happens to us, right? So finally, he gave the answer and he, he memorized it. But when he was first questioned, he forgot. But uh, and and see the um, the kind help coming from a, a companion of the spiritual life, right? And uh, what happens when an ordinary person uh, started um, talking about the achievements, ordinary worldly achievements, you know, material things, all the um, about wealth, properties, and all this. And the other friend also would would add more things to that, and the conversation goes on and on, right, endlessly. Um, and they don't understand that these con these conversations uh, are worldly conversations, and they don't lead to enlightenment detachment or liberation they just both all those uh, people uh, emerge in the in the sense of desire so they find satisfaction in those conversations but um, when you when you discuss things with a companion in the spiritual life who who knows the importance of the, the spiritual path and the the noble goals of life, you know, they would always change the topic from the worldly um, affairs and worldly things to a, to a noble goal. That's what Arhan Mughal Adhateru did, right? He, he was not interested in seeing all those details and decorations, the beauty of the mansion and all these things. He was not interested in and uh, he just uh, helped as a Kalyana Mitta, you know, what is important in this life. How much we talk about all these food, clothing, housing, vehicles, all these, you know, human pleasures. More and more desires, craving, attachment, clinging. These things would arise. They eventually lead to more and more... Uh, misery and pain, distress, and all these negative qualities, right? And what, what a blessing to have such a Kalyana Mitta who would always direct you in the, the right path, the right direction, 
you know, bringing all these topics of detachment, enlightenment, awakening, liberation. Right? That, that's an amazing thing. And even like, um, even first, the, the god Saka was a little bit ashamed when he was questioned in the midst of all the other gods. He was not mad at Arhant Mogana right? Because he, he already had that faith and respect towards towards an enlightened monk. And he he realized that these Kalyanamitas are such a treasure in our lives. They never harm us. They never want to uh, do anything that is unbeneficial to us. He, he already realized that. And he was so grateful and thankful. Isn't that a beautiful story? A, a meeting of a, of two Kalyanamitas. That's what we need too, right? We may go, sometimes we may be uh, uh, unmindful and, you know, uh, so we may make mistakes. But if we have those beautiful friends, you know, with beautiful hearts and noble qualities, it's such a blessing in our lives. They protect us in every direction. Do you have those kind of friends? Yes, very Pante. Yeah, very rare. Yeah. And also you can be such a friend to somebody else. That's how the spiritual spiritual life improves of the disciples of the Buddha helping each other. Uh, do you have any questions? So that is the end of the Chula Tanna Sankhya Sutta. That's a beautiful um, conversation between, and uh, that's not not about between humans and humans. It's between humans and goats, right? But uh, it's not that different. It's not that different. They are enjoying divine pleasures. We are enjoying human pleasures. We are learning the Dhamma taught by the Buddha and they are learning the Dhamma taught by the Buddha. We forget things and they forget things, right? And we need the help of Kalyanamitas. They need the help of Kalyanamitas. We try to practice the Dhamma. They try to practice the Dhamma. Uh, so you may you may get to meet God Sakka if you go there. I don't know if, whether you are going to go to heaven or to Brahma world or you are going to... Uh, attain enlightenment in this very life. So anyway, at least some of you will meet him and you can share the, the things you learned about him when you were in the human world. Gita, you would like to ask a question? Yes, Bhante. I had a question towards the end of our last class, but we didn't have enough time. Um, so I brought it to mind now to ask you um, uh, just for your wisdom and guidance. Um, you know, we talked about feeling last class. This is a very important um, link in the uh, 12 links of dependent origination. Um, so for an awakened mind, uh, someone who's fully awakened, when the feelings arise, they would use three things. And I just want to find out if there's anything else more that we can do. For example, they use noble wisdom, area noble wisdom. And then they use uh, mindfulness and awareness. So as it arises, in order to break the link and to see through impermanence, right? Dukkha, uh, unsatisfactory nature of life and non-self, there's absolutely nothing here but just the aggregates, right? So if we use that noble Aryan wisdom to break through when feelings arise so that we don't get involved and follow through a rabbit hole, now, that will be the correct process to, to actually be or having working towards an awakening and awakened mind. Is, is this correct or is there more tools that we can use in the toolkit to uh, actually stop that, it? That, that's a powerful, powerful uh, uh, wisdom part that we, should, we all should practice. Uh, and that uh, basically in the realm of Vipassana, mm -hmm. uh, 
con contemplating on the impermanence, suffering, and self nature of all the conditioned things. And uh, he speaks uh, especially about feelings, the arising, passing of feelings. Uh, yeah, but uh, the challenge here is that in order to contemplate the the, the three characteristics of a conditioned thing, there should be uh, there are some prerequisites, right? Those uh, supporting factors should come first. Otherwise, um, because the influence of those feelings and the defilements followed by those feelings are so strong, mm -hmm. we may not be able to uh, start contemplating on the uh, the true nature of feelings at once because we will be carried away by those emotions and defilements associated with those feelings. So the supporting factors are very important. The supporting factors are here. We can say the association of Kalyanamitas, listening to the Dhamma. Protecting um, the sila. Yeah, practicing sila. Also practicing the four establishments of mindfulness and practicing jhanas. All these support, supporting factors eventually um, eventually help us to be very sharp uh, using our vipassana knowledge, contemplating the, the true nature of, of all conditioned things. So it would also help to see our habit energies, um, which are coming from our past lives, uh, to learn to recognize them when they arise, because yeah, we that, know that basically that's the important, mindfulness, right? Mindfulness yeah. the sharpness of the mindfulness element. Rob, uh, you like to ask a question? Uh, just about the, the sutta, when, uh, when Buddha gave the explanation to Saka, uh, Moggallana, Moggallana was there, he heard it. Hmm. Why, I'm just curious, why at the end does Moggallana go back to the Buddha and ask if the Buddha can recall what, uh, what happens? I'm just wondering about the purpose of that. Maybe Buddha... At that time, Buddha didn't see the Mughalana Bhante was sitting there uh, because it's, it's in the, always it's, uh, it's a huge crowd when Buddha was teaching. So, um, and also, maybe it happened uh, some time ago. So he just wanted to... Um, he, he just wanted to start the conversation with the Buddha to tell that he, he this is what he did. This is how he helped... Uh, a companion in the spiritual life. So he, he just wanted to start the con conversation. In order to start the conversation, uh, maybe he asked, uh, does the Blessed One remember teaching uh, teaching uh, such a deep Dhamma to, to a very famous uh, God? All right? So maybe just to start the conversation, he, he asked about that. I see. So it's just an introduction. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Another question, there's a line, uh, not to be anxious, they personally become extinguished. They personally become extinguished. I'm just curious about the word personally. You could easily say they become extinguished, but there seems to be some emphasis on personally becoming extinguished. Just not important, but just curious about that. Yeah, so that basically uh, refers to the individual attainment of extinguishment, I guess. So that means, uh, you know, it, it, it's your, it, to, to emphasize that it becomes your own experience. I see. You personally, you personally see that. You personally experience the liberation. Right. Understand it, see it, feel it. I see. Yeah. It, okay. Just, just to see, say that it's not through somebody else's wisdom or not, not through somebody else's experience or it's not because somebody else says so and so it, it it becomes your own experience it's like firsthand firsthand experience right right okay thank you bante good so before going to the malan put the sutta i just uh, was reading some suttas about god sakka 
because he became our friend in this sutta and uh, and relate to him um do you like to learn uh, more things about god sakka and some people asked about different names used for god sakka i think there are there are interesting uh, information here about god sakka and also you are going to meet him some of you are going to meet him in the future so it's better to know more about him <laughs> when you go there and this is in the uh, tava team sa right oh. yeah he is yeah he is the leader for the third two heaven uh, chatu maharajik and tava team and you will you will realize that he was a human being like us this is the, how he explains about himself this is from the sangita nikaya uh, sakka sangita chapter on the god sakka this is the first sutta and also you will realize that it's not easy to go to uh, it's not an easy thing to go to heaven he worked so hard for sakka to become the leader of gods and he he practiced so many good qualities at sabati mendicants in a former life when saka was a human being he undertook seven vows and it was because of undertaking these that he achieved the status of saka what seven as long as i live may i support my parents as long as i live may i honor the elders in the family as long as i live may i speak gently As long as I live may I not speak divisively As long as I live may I live at home rid of the stain of stinginess freely generous open-handed loving to let go committed to charity loving to give and to share As long as I live may I speak the truth As long as I live may I be free of anger or should anger arise may i quickly get rid of it in a former life when saka was a human being he undertook seven vows and it was because of undertaking these that he achieved the status of saka a person who respects their parents and honors the elders in the family whose speech is gentle and courteous and has given up divisiveness who's committed to getting rid of stinginess is truthful and has mastered anger the gods of the 33 call them truly a good person ah uh, is that amazing how the our human being became the lord of gods and the, and the true qualities that make a god hmm the true qualities that make a, make somebody a god not a not an a simple god a, a leader of god and the other uh, remarkable thing is that he made these vows and started practicing without the help of a buddha when he was in the human world his name was maga he was his name was maga the youth maga and at that time there wasn't a buddha's dispensation in the human world nobody knew about the teachings of of an enlightened one he just thought okay these are the good qualities as i understand these are the very difficult things for a human being to practice these are the noble qualities so he thought to himself is that amazing and he realized okay these are the noble qualities i should practice and it's, it's not for one year not for two years not for few years is as long as i live that was how committed he was dedicated to his his noble uh, practice that's so that's how we realize the true heaven that's how we realize the true gods a human being goes to heaven how by practicing beautiful qualities taking care of the parents being generous 
doing lots of volunteering, helping others. Did you see those beautiful words? Rid of stain of stain, stinginess. Stinginess, greediness is a stain. And he wanted to live free of that stain. Freely generous. Freely generous. Open-handed. Open-handed means you are ready. You are ready to um, volunteering, ready to uh, practice giving and sharing. You, you are not hiding anything. Loving to let go. You know, you're not attached to material gifts. Uh, rather, you are um, you 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 enjoy giving and sharing. The happiness comes to you when you give and share things with others, not when you collect for yourself. That that's the meaning. Loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and sh to share, right? And speaking the truth. And think about the last one, controlling anger. And he, he, he would control anger and he, if it arises, he would quickly get rid of it. These are the things that that lead to heaven. And he practices he practiced these things with great determination. And uh, because uh, but unfortunately, he didn't have the opportunity to go for refuge to the Buddha at that time or to offer the dhana to the Sangha and all these things. So what happened was he was, uh, his merit in the human, in the heavenly world after he became the Lord of Gods was um, almost extinguished, like almost finished when he met the Buddha, the Gautama Buddha. And Buddha gave a sermon and he asked questions and those that conversation is recorded in the Sakka Panya Sutta in the Diga Nikaya, long length discourses of the Buddha, a very deep conversation about deep Dhamma uh, with the Buddha. And then while he was, the, the, the Sakka was listening to those teachings of the Buddha, he attained the first stage of enlightenment. As soon as he attained the first stage of enlightenment, it was... Uh, huge accumulation of good karma because you, you are very well established in the precepts, virtue, mindfulness, you know, or the wholesome qualities uh, because we have discussed this before. Attaining the, the stages of enlightenment means always attaining the, the beautiful, noble qualities is the increase of qualities Noble qualities, increase of the loving kindness, compassion, gratitude, thankfulness, patience, giving and sharing, generosity, kind words, compassionate heart, wisdom, detachment, you know, all this, the, the, the growth of development of noble qualities is another name for the stages of enlightenment. Uh, <clears throat> nothing else. So if you are, if you're getting closer to stages of enlightenment, that means beautiful, noble qualities should be reflected from your life. And if you, if you claim that you have attained, uh, or you are getting closer to these, these uh, status stages of enlightenment, but your ego has, if your ego has increased, hmm? if your conceit have, has increased, if you, if you have become more greedy, huh? if, you, if your anger has increased, if your selfishness has increased, no, you are not getting closer to stages of enlightenment. That's how you realize. So, yeah, with the attainment of the first stage of enlightenment, becoming a Shota Panna disciple, it God Saka achieved a huge um, growth of wholesome qualities and merits. 
and at the same time like while while he was conversing with the blessed one the god saka passed away from his heavenly life he passed away because the merit that made him the lord of god was over while he was conversing with the blessed one instantaneously he took rebirth in the same position as the lord of gods as a result of attaining the first stage of enlightenment can you imagine the power of the merit you gain when you attain these stages of enlightenment unbelievable and god saka was so happy he was so happy and he was so grateful he 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 repeatedly said god sak uh, the blessed one saved my life because if the buddha didn't go there what would have happened uh, because the god sak had that power of merit which he earned when uh, the buddha's dispensation was absent so if you collect merit if you um, give dana if you meditate if you keep precepts during the time of, uh, of a dispensation of the buddha with the help of the teachings of the buddha you collect enormous amount of merit and it is immeasurable incalculable that's the difference so when the when that power of merit was uh, about to over the gods god sakka didn't have a uh, new marriage so it's only because of the buddha's help he earned a new marriage and that was so powerful and he took rebirth again as the uh, leader of god god sakka even uh, even today he is the leader and he could see his uh, future as soon as he attained this first stage of enlightenment and he he explained that to them. he could see his future and he he would come to the human world one more time you don't know when <laughs> you don't know when right but he saw that and that was that's going to be his final human life and then he would uh, he would follow the noble eightfold path further and then he would take another heavenly rebirth from there he would go to the brahm world and that would be his final life in this cycle of ex he could see all those things. isn't it amazing that you can see your future you are not going to be reborn in a plane of misery and you are not going to make any bad karma that will put your life in danger isn't it amazing yeah he was so that fortunate god sakka was that fortunate so that is how the and the other amazing thing is that buddha discovered all these things how what kind of good qualities god saka practiced when he was in the human world that's another amazing thing this the buddha explained right and these are the other names for the god of uh, saka nesavati in jetas grove there the buddha said to the medicants medicants in a former life when saka was a human being he was a brahmi brahmanical student named maga that's why he called magava in the former life when saka was a human being he gave gifts in a stronghold after stronghold that's why he called purindada the stronghold giver in the former life when saka was a human being he gave gifts carefully that's why he called saka the careful in a former life when saka was a human being he gave the gift of a guest house that's why he called wasawa the how the houser saka thinks of a thousand things in a moment that's why he's called sahasaka the thousand eye saka's saka thinks of uh, saka's wife is the demon is a demon's maiden named suja that's why he called sujampati 
Suda's husband. Sakarus as sovereign's lot over the gods of the 33. That's why he called lot of God. In a former life, in a former life, when Saka was a human being, he undertook seven vows. And it was because of undertaking this that he achieved the status of Saka. What seven? As long as I live, may I support my parents. As long as I live, may I honor the elder in the family. As long as I live, may I speak gently. As long as I live, may I not speak divisively. As long as I live, may I live at home rid of the stain of stinginess, freely generous, open-handed, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. As long as I live, may I speak the truth. As long as I live, may I be free of anger. Or should anger arise, may I quickly get rid of it. In a former life, when Saka was a human being, he undertook seven vows. And it was because of undertaking this that he achieved the status of Saka, a person who respects their parents and honors the elders in the family, who speak in gentle and courteous and has given up divisiveness, who's committed to getting rid of stinginess, is truthful and has mastered anger. The God of the 33 called them truly a good person. Sadhu, sadhu. So did you realize all the meanings of these different names? Oh, so many names for one person, right? So he's called Magawa. He's called Magawa. And uh, that was his name in the human world. He was a youth, um, young man. They already called him the, the boy Magawa. And Purin Dada means, uh, the, the simple meaning is, uh, when there was a uh, volunteering opportunity, he would be the first to take it. He was, he would be the first to participate in it. And when there is a charity event, he would be the first to, to contribute. That's how he got the name Purin Dada. Because you know some people, because this is a difficult thing. That's how he generated powerful merit. Because some people wait for others to donate first, and then they, they think to donate later, right? <laughs> But he did the opposite. He always wanted to do it when the need arose. And um, yeah, he, he didn't postpone, basically. He didn't postpone the, the, the charitable events. And then uh, Sakka. Sakka means Sakka uh, Chandana Deti. Um, when he practiced giving and sharing, when he gave a gift to somebody, uh, he would always um, arrange it nicely, you know, clean. He would give a clean thing, nice thing, um, you know, with, with much respect. It's not like, I don't need it, so you can take it. He wouldn't say like that, All right? So it, he was not giving, like throwing away things very carefully, you know, with respect to the receiver, with love and compassion for the receiver, and uh, in a way that the receiver would have a smile in his face, he was always uh, gave gifts like that. So that's the real name behind Sakka, the meaning Sakka. Sakka Chandanandi. Vasava means uh, he built with his friends a, a big um, a guest house. For the people to rest and he donated it for the community. That's how he became the Vasava. Thousand I Sahasanetta or Sahasa Sakka that uh, he had that opportunity to think about thousand things in a moment. That, that's an amazing thing. And Suja's husband, Sujampati, here demon means the translation for the Asura, Asuras, and they were also um, some kind of devas, but um, they were kind of against the suras. Suras means the good devas. 
and the Asuras always wanted to defeat them and, uh, and take the power over Tavatinsa. Uh, and the Sujja was one of those Asuras, and she was so beautiful um, because, again, Sujja also was, was a kind of a Deva, a female Deva, but from the Asura world. Uh, and there's a beautiful story behind their marriage. So you can can read that, how the, how the um, uh, Asura maiden Suja became the husband of the god Sakka. Uh, and then the, um, yeah, so this is about these different names. And this is a beautiful uh, to about how he respected the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is a short sutta. To, to know how these heavenly beings, even heavenly beings, powerful uh, creatures respect the Buddha. Near Savati in Jeta's Grove. Now, at that time, the Buddha had gone into retreat for the day's meditation. Then Saka, Lord of Gods, and Brahma Sahampati approached the Buddha and stationed themselves one by each doorpost. Then Saka recited this verse in the Buddha's presence. Rise, hero, victor in battle, with burden put down. Wander the world without obligation. Your mind is fully liberated like the moon on the 15th night. Lord of gods, that's not how to pay homage to the realized ones. This is how it should be done. Rise hero, victor in battle, leader of the caravan. Wander the world without obligation. Let the blessed one teach the Dhamma. There will be those who understand. So the Brahma Sahampati also uh, one of the friends of God Shak, and he the Brahma Sahampati was the one who invited the Buddha to teach the Dhamma for the uh, the start of Buddha in enlightenment. The sutta, uh, there is another sutta about yeah, yeah. Usaka worship. Near Savati in Jetta's Grove, once upon a time, Mendikin Saka, Lord of Gods, addressed his charioteer, Matali. My dear Matali, harness the chariot with its team of a thousand thoroughbreds. We will go to a park and see the scenery. Yes, Lord, replied Matali. He harnessed the chariot and informed Saka. Good sir, the chariot with its team of a thousand thoroughbreds has been harnessed. Please go at your convenience. Then Saka descended from the palace of victory, raised his joined palms and revered the mendicant Sangha. So Matali, the charioteer addressed Saka in verse. It's these who should worship you, namely the humans stuck in their putrid bodies, sunk in a corpse, stricken by hunger and thirst. Why then do you envy those who are homeless Vasava, relate the hermit's way of life. Let us hear what you say. This is why I envy the homeless, Matali. When they leave a village, they proceed without concern. They hoard no goods in storerooms, nor in pots or baskets. They seek food prepared by others, and true to their vows, live on that. The wise whose words are full of wisdom live peacefully and quietly. Gods fight with demons and mortals fight each other, Matali. Not fighting among those who fight, extinguished among those who are armed, not grasping among those who grasp, there who I worship, Matali. Those who you worship seem to be the best in the world, Saka. I too will worship those who you worship, Vasava. After saying this, Magava, the chief, 
king of gods, Suja's husband, having worshipped the mendicant Sangha, climbed into his chariot. Sadhu, sadhu. So he worshipped the Sangha, right? He worshipped the Sangha. So the people think the gods are the higher, right? Humans are lower. But gods worship humans. If humans have advanced qualities, noble qualities, the gods worship, you become worthy of honor, worthy of respect. Isn't that beautiful? That even the leader of gods worship Bhantes, the Sangha. <clears throat> and think about his confidence in the Sangha, all these beautiful qualities, right? That's how he realized all these qualities. So he realized humans fight each other, they are armed, they kill each other, but these enlightened people, they, <clears throat> they live peacefully with uh, limitless compassion to all beings without harming anybody, without killing anybody. And he realized that's a beautiful quality among the Sangha. See, not fighting among those who fight, Extinguished among those who are armed, not grasping among those who grasp. They are who I worship, Mata. And, and praising their simple life. So he, he really liked the song. And can you believe that the god Shaka and other gods worship to you as well? Will you be amazed to see that? There was a sutta about that. Yeah, that's this sutta. Yeah. This is how he humble he is. Yeah, you can see is the humility. Even though he was the leader of gods, he still worships the lay disciples of the Buddha. Because he always appreciates the qualities, noble qualities, spiritual qualities of a human being. So at Savati, the Buddha was staying at Savati. Once upon a time, Mendikan Sakka, Lord of Gods, addressed his charity Amatali. My dear Matali, harness the chariot with its team of thousand tower bridge. We will go to a park and see the scenery. Yes, Lord, replied Matali. He harnessed the chariot and informed the Sakka God, Sir, the chariot with its team of thousand tower bridge has been harnessed. Please go at your convenience. The Sakka descended from the Thalas of Victor, raised his joined palms and revered the different quarters before, you know, getting into the vehicle. So Matali, the chariot here, his driver basically, addressed Sakka in verse. He asked, those proficient in the three Vedas worship you. You know, the some people, from they follow some doctrine, they worship gods, they worship Brahmas. So he asked about that. They, they worship you from those humans. As do all the aristocrats on earth. Even kings worship you, the four great kings and the glorious 30. The four great kings worship the god Sakka, the, the devas in the Tavat in the heaven worship you. So what is the name of the spirit that you worship, Sakka? He was curious, right? Because he can see that everybody in the human world, all these powerful people who do sacrifice, fire sacrifice, um, through all these mantras, chanting and all these people worship god Sakka. But now you before you get into the vehicle, you joined your uh, palms and you worship somebody. What's the name of that? That special being. And the god Sakka answers. Those proficient in the three Vedas worship me. It is true, right? As do all the aristocrats on earth. The four great kings and the glorious thirty, they all worship me. But I revere those accomplished in ethics. That means I respect the people who keep five precepts. 
no killing no stealing no sexual misconduct no lying no intoxicating drinks and drugs who keep five precepts who have long trained in immersion that means the people who meditate immersion means samadhi who practices samadhi he worship the people who practice samadhi who have rightly gone forth committed to the spiritual life i worship the monks and nuns who have left the world life and be, and the, committed to this uh, spiritual life i worship them i also worship those householders who ethical lay followers okay before he was talking about the precepts of of the monastic basically 10 precepts and the two more than 200 precepts of uh, higher order monks and uh, so the, basically he worship monastics and now he says about the householders the ethical lay followers who keep five precepts or eight precepts on the the full moon power is the upasa the days who make merit by practicing giving and sharing who make merit keeping precepts meditation supporting a partner in the principled manner uh, that basically he says i worship the husbands who take care of wives well i worship the wives who who respect the husbands well and who help each other i worship those husbands and wives did you hear this before that he worship the the good husbands and good wives those who you worship now the the driver says to him those who you worship seem to be the best in the world sakka i too will worship those who you worship sakka so he agreed the matali the charity driver agreed that the, the god sakka's uh, um conclusion was right and they those people were the the people who were the of respect and honor after saying this magava the chief king of god suja's husband having worshiped the quarters climbed into his chariot that's how he would always get into the vehicle you know after paying homage to the buddha Dham, dhamma sangha and the disciples of the buddha looking down the human world then he would get into the vehicle it's a completely different picture right about the heavens we have heard and the, the true heaven so 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 some of the beautiful uh, the few suttas about god sakka and you can read more about his good qualities he about, about his feelings about his confidence in the dhamma about his advice given to his uh, uh, colleagues in heaven he can read more about going to the sangha nikaya the connected discourses and the the chapter on the sakka sakka sangha uh rob you have a question yeah just wondering uh, if you can say a little bit more about the quarters maybe i missed it i think you said something about it but i just wasn't sure what that meant the quarters uh where did you see that uh having worshiped the quarters climbed into his chariot oh quarters means uh, the you know the when he looked down on the human world uh he can see sangha and the lady sabas living in the southern direction northern direction eastern direction western direction so he would basically worship the entire earth he would worship all that all those sangha and the lady sapals living in the all the directions on okay. earth okay. that's the meaning okay. worshiping all the quarters you could say the four corners the four corners of the world yeah right i see thank you good So now you like to go and meet the god sakka he's such a such a good kalyanami faithful devotee of the buddha so much devotion um do they also have the same i mean just like us family do they have kids or just wondering the life in heaven <laughs> and what do they do what do they do 
it's just wondering. Unlike us, we have to work, right, to earn a living. But then, oh. and, and they oh, don't. They don't have. They don't yeah, eat, they don't, right? Do they? Because of their mere power or merit, they earn from the human world when they were in the human world. You know, they are the people. Okay, one group of humans in the human world, they are kind of selfish. They use most of their time to earn things for themselves, to, to collect material things for themselves. They don't care what happens to others. They are not sensitive to pain in others' lives. They, so they don't want to be generous. They don't want to do any volunteering. You see the, that kind of group, right? And then the another group of people, you know, they they have more compassion towards towards others, kindness, friendliness, more generous feelings, volunteering feeling, helping others. Uh, do you see that kind of group? So, so they they sacrifice some of their happiness in order to help others, in order to make others happy. So they do some difficult things. That, that, that's why those people are not common, because it's difficult to sacrifice your against your happiness and to, and to work for others. It's difficult. Think about when people try to earn money. They lie to others, they harm others, they harm animals, they harm humans. You're just thinking about money, about business, about marketing and all these things. So much greediness in the mind. It's because they are thinking about their own wealth, their own profit, their own gains, their prayers. So among these people, some people do the difficult thing, thinking about others' well-being. Because of earning, and they earn merit when they do like that. So they did something difficult when they were in the human world, and now they are rewarded when they are reborn in a better, more comfortable, convenient world called heaven. They are rewarded. How? They don't need to work there to earn money. Everything appears. All the happy things appear in heaven by the power of their merit they earned when they were in the human world. Everything appears. You, you don't need to put gas into your vehicle. The vehicle runs with the divine psychics. You don't need to earn money to buy food by clothing, by housing, anything. When you go there, your mansion, divine mansion is appear there. And, you know, interestingly, there are some stories that even before the good doers go to heaven, their mansion appears there and it's waiting, attendance waiting there for you to come, for those individuals to come. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's fair because they sacrificed here uh, many things uh, for others and they worked hard for the other's well-being and now they are rewarded. Yes, uh, it's uh, lots of easy, convenient um, uh, ways that that you gain happiness there. But the experience is uh, divine happiness is far more greater than the human happiness. And it's earned by the uh, meditorious actions. And what do they do there? They meditate. If they listen to the teachings of the Buddha before they went to heaven, they meditate there. They follow the Noble Eightfold Path there. They participate in the Dhamma programs there. And also they... Uh, they come to the human world when the Buddha and the Sangha were uh, available. They listen to the Dhamma, discuss the Dhamma with them. And also the, they, they really like to help the 
the people who do good things so even in the invisible manner they would they would help the people who do good things that's why we share uh, merit with them after doing something good they they really like to rejoice in those good merit and they protect those humans who do good things there is a yeah they they have things to do <clears throat> and also they dance they sing it's a sensory realm maybe some of the gods some of the gods are not interested in those things and they they like seclusion maybe they have different mansions uh secluded mansions you know and even though now you forget maybe you came from heaven to heaven world your merit was over in the heaven maybe you were, you were there with the god sakka now you forget everything and you you feel that the god sak is very unfamiliar heaven is when very unfamiliar you have lots of questions in here about heaven and how this and that but maybe you were there who knows your merit was over and the next merit was uh, the merit that can bring you to the human world and that brought you to the human world maybe now the god sak is thinking now if he is listening to this he is thinking oh he, he doesn't remember that he was with me he was one of my friends <laughs> now he he doesn't remember anything don't forget when buddha asked the monks to teach the dhamma he asked the monks to teach dhamma for the benefit of gods and humans because gods are also listening to this dhamma remember charata bhikkhave charika bahu jana hitaye bahu jana sukhaye attaye hitaye sukhaye deva manussana so monks travel from region to region from place to place and teach the dhamma good in the beginning good in the middle good in the end for the benefit of gods and humans no bante a thought came to my mind you know because of this war i saw on the news there was a doctor who traveled from florida and he was helping all the injured people and saving lives so it's purely selfless he was going to the border and then he was even going inside ukraine and innocent children and women and you know he was and soldiers too he was helping them patching up their wounds and helping them selflessly they showed it on tv they even interviewed him so that's the you know part. That, that's the path to heaven yeah that's like a bodhisattva right so i was thinking when they pass away because he's not exposed to the buddha dharma like we are um but the, I, they'll but be born it is not in vain it, it's going, yeah it's he'll going go to, into a heavenly realm and hopefully he'll come across follow, the dharma it's yeah. going to follow no matter um which uh, you know background you are from which faith yeah. you have if it is a meritorious action based on all some all some roots it's it's not in vain it's, it's not going to disappear it's going to follow the the doer as a never departing shadow can we get the help of god sucker to generate loving kindness in a person's uh, uh maybe you can ask <laughs> you say i made it with god sak and request okay so 